around you and then you can take a seat. Howdy and good morning. My name's Stephen Hunt. I've been at Crossbridge for a very, very long time. We were trying to do the math this morning, and uh, I lost an hour, so I'm not going to do it. Um, I serve in the 56 ministry with the youth, and I'm also one of our group coaches. Uh, and I'm going to be reading to you today from John chapter 18, 1 through 11. <clears throat> when Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. So he asked them again, Whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. Of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? This is God's word. Thank you, Stephen. If you guys don't know Stephen and his sweet wife, Sonia, y'all need to meet them after the service at some point. They're a great couple. Um, they have been serving Crossbridge for quite some time now. Uh, well, we're super uh, glad that you all are here this morning. We're going to con be continuing on our Unstoppable Life series, going through the Gospel of John. Uh, the last couple weeks, Chuck has been camping out in John chapter 17, getting to unpack Jesus' high priestly prayer for his disciples and for his future followers, right? And today, uh, I get to jump into John chapter 18, where Chuck got five kind of weeks for John 17. I've got one day for John 18, so be patient with me. We're going to cover a lot today. It's going to be great. But before we dive right in, I'm going to pray for us this morning, okay? King Jesus, you are so, so good. We've gotten to reflect on uh, just gospel unity the last week and so many other great things that you prayed for us uh, before you headed to the garden. But today we get to look at um, those first steps on the road to redemption for us. Father, as we open up your word, would you be present? Would you use uh, me? Um, would you help me to unpack your word, not my words today? And it's in Jesus' name we pray, your name, amen. Like I said, John chapter 18, we're jumping right into it. And the first two verses, we're going to jump right into it because it helps set the context, right? When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the brook Kidron, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. We're back to the action of Jesus, okay? The last couple of weeks have been all, of, all this great, beautiful prayer, this lovely prayer that he's had for us. Now we're getting back to the action of Jesus and what he's about to go do. He's setting the stage. He goes across the Kidron Valley to a hill called the Mount of Olives. It's just east of the city of Jerusalem. And uh, if you've ever gotten to, to visit the, the city of Jerusalem or the, the country of Israel, it's a really great, great uh, eye-opening experience. I got to go back in 2008, and I've got some pictures. So here's a picture first of the Garden of Gethsemane on the left, 
and then the Mount of Olives is on the right. So you see this church kind of right there in the middle that's right next to this garden. When I hear garden, I think of flowers and tulips and pretty things. But here in the context of uh, uh, the Middle East, a garden here is a grove of trees. It's, it's uh, pretty barren. Uh, they put flowers in there now to make it feel a little more you know, lively. But uh, um, it's these olive trees that Jesus and his disciples go to. And it's a place they visited frequently. And I think it's uh, important to note because it's kind of a hill and it's just about 100 yards east of uh, the city of Jerusalem. Uh, I bring this up because what Jesus and his disciples are probably looking at would be the next slide. It'll be the city of Jerusalem. This picture is taken just a little further up the, the, the hill, the Mount of Olives. Um, so the Mount of Olives, the view might have been a little lower, but it's still, the, Jesus is probably sitting there with his disciples looking at the city of Jerusalem. Instead of this golden dome on the top, that's a, a Muslim mosque today, but back in Jesus' time there would have been the temple looking him right in the face. Right? Well, we know from the other gospel accounts, lots of things happen in this. We, we, we get the picture in the gospel of John. Jesus is ready. He's on board. He's about to go do all these great things at the cross for us. But the other gospels lend an ear a little bit, right? We know that this is the place that Jesus invited the disciples to pray for him. He said, don't, don't lose heart. Pray for me. Pray for me. Don't fall asleep. We also know this is the place where Jesus asked the Father, right? If you're willing to remove this cup from me, do so. But if not, my, not my will, your will be done. We also know in the garden that this is also the place where Jesus was in such excruciating like weight and, and angsty and anxiety that he was sweating drops of blood. Both of those are taken from Luke chapter 22. John doesn't bring up any of that. It doesn't mean that that didn't happen. He's just got a different focus for us. He's got a different focus for, for us in his gospel, Okay. Just like the beginning of John started with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Unlike the other three Gospels, Jesus is, or John is drawing our attention to something different, to something bigger, something more grand, to a bigger picture of Jesus. You see, sin entered the world in the Garden of Genesis, but here in the Gospel account of John, we see redemption, the redemption of the world starting in a different garden, here in the Garden of Gethsemane continue to read with me. John chapter 18, verse 3 through 6. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees, went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to him, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them, when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. They drew back and fell to the ground. We see Judas has rallied kind of a posse, if you will, right? I think of like an old Western where they go to arrest a, a bandit or an outlaw. They've rallied a posse. They've shown up to arrest Jesus in the dark of night. His disciples are there. Judas, I mean, it makes sense, right? He's got Peter. No telling what Peter's going to do. Um, and we've also got Simon the Zealot. My, my thought is Simon the Zealot is probably a pretty good fighter, okay? He could have pulled out a sword. He and Peter alone could have probably taken a few of them. So Judas is kind of right, especially when we see what Peter does here in a little bit, right? He pulls out a sword and chops off a dude's ear. But Jesus knows it full well. He's anticipating it. They don't get the first word in. Jesus does. Jesus steps forward. Jesus steps forward and asks, whom do you seek? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus' phrase is simple. It's a phrase. Ego, a me. I am he. In the Greek, it's just simply this phrase, ego, a me. And it can also be simply translated, I am. Not even I am he, that the he we kind of add in there. Um, this isn't um, uh, uh, a gender thing. That's not what he's talking about here. He's identifying himself. And in this phrase, I am he, ego, a me, is a lot of theological subtext. It's a lot of theological implications of what he's saying here. This is a phrase that we see throughout the Gospel of John. We're going to hit on it a couple times. But we also see it all the way back in Exodus. Jesus is not just saying that he is Jesus of Nazareth. He's saying he's so much more. Any of you remember watching ever The, uh, the Prince of Egypt? Uh, uh, I think it's DreamWorks did it. One of my favorite movies of all time. It's a great depiction, a great cartoon version. We know there's some bad like biblical like you know movies out there, but The Prince of Egypt, this one scene is so spot on, I love it. But it's the scene where Moses has right been run out of Egypt. Uh, he's killed a man, and he's on the run, and he's hiding, and he's now a shepherd for his father-in-law, right? He's out tending the sheep, 
and he comes upon a burning bush, a bush that's engulfed in flames, but not being consumed. It's this. For these big theological truths that come from this phrase. He's self-existent. He, he doesn't, he's not dependent upon anything or anyone else other than himself and the Trinity. He is the creator and sustainer of all that exists. Everything you see around you was put into place by him and is working and at work because of him. God is also immutable. This is what this means. It means you can't turn him off. He is who he has always been. He's not changing. He's not becoming something different. Think about that for just one second. I've got three kids. They are changing every single day. Riley, one of my twins, just lost her, her front tooth, and now she kind of talks with the lift right now because she's got one tooth gone. The other one's about to be gone. And so, and we kind of teased her. It's too bad it's not Christmas time, so we can sing All I Want for Christmas is My Two Front Teeth, right? Um, but we might still do that anyways. Um, they are changing every single day. I, I'm an adult. And I'm changing every single day. Uh, th those of you with age and wisdom in this room, you have not arrived yet either. You're still changing. You're still growing. You're still maturing. God has never had to learn something new. That is mind-blowing if we really think about it. There's so much theological implications to this simple phrase, I am he. So my first observation we've got to make today is Jesus is claiming to be God. We've seen him do it multiple times throughout the Gospel of John, but here again, he's doing it yet again. Um, so much so that John has, has, been, has been known for the seven I am statements of Jesus. We have touched on them a little bit through this series, but we haven't really unpacked them fully. I'm not going to unpack all of them, but I think this will add fuel to your, to your biblical studies this week, if you will, as you uh, uh, dive deeper into this in your quiet times this week. What are the I am statements of Jesus? Jesus made seven different statements through the Gospel of John that are life-giving and transforming to us. I'm gonna, they're going to be on the screen, so after they're all up, I would say take a picture of them, okay, once they're all up. Number one, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. As bread sustains physical life, so too does Christ offer and sustains our spiritual life. Right? Bread was for the body. Jesus is for the soul. I am the light of the world. John 8, 12. To a world that's lost in darkness. Darkness entered the world through Adam and Eve and sin. To a dark world, Jesus steps in and says, I am the light of the world. I am the door of the sheep. John 10, 7. I am the door of the sheep. He's the door that we must enter into to have fellowship with God. But also a door protects us as well. It protects the sheep. It keeps the wolves out. It keeps, uh, keeps us in and the wolves out. I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. 25. Death is not the final word. To the, a first century Jew, this would have been revolutionary. They didn't believe in the resurrection of the life. But Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd, John 10, 11. Jesus is committed to caring and watching for us the way a shepherd cares for his sheep. Think about that. He's not a, a, a dictator or a king. He's not a general sending us out uh, into war. Uh, spiritually speaking, we might be at war, but he, he leads us like a shepherd leads his sheep, carefully, tenderly, right? He leaves oftentimes the 99 to get the one, right? I am the true vine, John 15, 1. By attaching ourselves to Christ, we're enabled, uh, we enable his life to flow through us. We stay connected to him. We get to bear fruit. Not just fruit for ourselves, but fruit for the Father, fruit for the kingdom. 
And then perhaps my favorite, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. John 14, 6. Jesus is saying, you want to know what truth is? Come to me. I am it. No one comes to the Father except through me. Like I said, this could be your quiet time this week, okay? Day in, day out. Take one of these. Look at it. Each one of these is like a different facet of a diamond, okay? We look at Jesus, and we can pick him up, and we can look at him in all sorts of angles and lights. And if you've seen a diamond, and the way light hits a diamond, Jesus just gets more beautiful the more we unpack these, okay? And what happens when he says, I am he? They fall to the ground. They fall to the ground. A very common thing that happens when the Lord reveals himself all throughout the Old Testament. People fall down. And this isn't like they're just tripping over themselves. Jesus didn't jump out. Boo! Gotcha! You know, oh, they scared him and he fall. No. Jesus, power emanates from Jesus. Somehow, some way, some miraculous way. That shouldn't surprise us, right? Jesus has power. Jesus has power. That's my observation number two this morning. Jesus has power here. Well, duh, Ryan, Jesus is Jesus. He has power. He's done lots of things. Absolutely. But it's important to note that here in the garden when he's getting arrested. Jesus has power. We've seen him turn water to wine. We've seen him heal the sick. We've seen him uh, walk on water. We've seen him calm storms. We've seen him feed 5,000s, four or five thousands multiple times. We've seen him, uh, he's even brought people back from the dead. These awesome acts of power are to confirm and affirm that Jesus is who he says he is, the great I am. Here in these moments, Jesus is not stripped or robbed of his power. I think I look at this and I look at a lamb being led to the slaughter as Jesus is uh, uh, interacting with uh, the, the mob here. And it's true. It's true to an extent. But I don't want us to forget Jesus is still powerful here. We get a picture of meekness here in Jesus. Uh, meekness. This summer we unpacked a lot uh, the phrase, right, that Jesus is gentle and lowly. The men over the summer studied a book all about Jesus being gentle and lowly. Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power restrained. Jesus is restrained here. He's like a, a chained up pit bull, you know. Uh, uh, it's, it's got power, but he's, he's, he's pent back, okay. He's pulled back. Here we see Jesus has power. Continue on with me in verse 7 through 11. So he asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. To those who you gave me, I have lost not one. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. His, the servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Here, Jesus is kind and lets them get back up and asks again, right? <laughs> They've fallen down. All right, take your time, get back up. I'm going to restrain my power. I'm not going to push you down again. I'm not going to shove you down with my power again. He asks again to continue on the story and what needs to happen, right? And he immediately steps in to defend his disciples. He says, don't touch them, leave them alone. Even after Peter jumps out and slashes a dude's ear off uh, with a sword, right? Uh, if, if it's me, it would make sense that Peter should have gotten arrested too, right? We don't see it here in this story, but um, in Luke we see that Jesus picks up Malchus's ear and heals him and puts it back on, right? No harm, no foul. That's probably what Jesus is saying, guys. Leave, leave Peter alone. I need him to, to not be arrested. I need the disciples to witness what comes next. You see... Everything about the Gospels to us and the New Testament letters are first-hand accounts of what's going on. So Jesus steps forward, takes all of it on himself, puts his disciples and keeps them safe, and continues on, right? But Peter is pretty lucky, let's be clear here, okay? Uh, he should have gotten arrested too. Uh, but here, Jesus doesn't want an uprising. It's not time. That's not what he came to do. Instead, he has this phrase, okay? He has this phrase at the end of this that we have to focus on. Put your sword into its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? You see, God the Father has a purpose for Jesus and why he sent him. God the Father has a purpose for Jesus. That's our third observation this morning. Let's unpack this one phrase right here. He has come to drink the cup that the Father has given him. 
This is a very unusual statement, uh, but obviously it sounds like a metaphor. That's because it is a metaphor. Jesus is using metaphorical language here. He's linking himself again, not just back to God in the Old Testament, but lots of elements in the Old Testament. Listen to Psalm 75 verses 7 and 8 right here. But it is God who executes judgment, putting down one and lifting up another. For in the hand of the Lord there is a cup with foaming wine well mixed. And he pours out from it, and all the wicked of the earth shall drain it down to the dregs. Oh, Ryan, feel good one did this morning, huh? Yeah. No, guys, this is a metaphor Jesus is using, and it's a metaphor for death. It's a metaphor for death, judgment. Um, and in fact, this cup that he's referencing is the cup of God's wrath. Whoa, 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 we're, we're New Testament Christians, Ryan. We, God's love. God is love. He's not wrath anymore. He's love. The reason he can be in his love to us is because Jesus has fulfilled his wrath and drank the cup of his wrath. This is what Jesus has come to do. There's lots of things in the Bible that we as Christians oftentimes aren't comfortable talking about. And it's challenging, it's difficult. And a lot of these things, the world sure as heck doesn't want to hear. God judges? What you, no, 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 no. No, we don't judge anyone, you know, right? You know, you do you. You live your life, no judgment here. That's our culture's M.O. right now. But what Jesus is saying here is, no, God does judge, and he has judged. We don't like talking about it, right? Judge, what does he judge? He judges evil, wickedness, and sin. And the, that judgment gets the, the privilege, gets the result of drinking the cup of wrath from God. But here we go. Jesus is meant to drink that cup, not us. Well, yes, we are meant to, but Jesus does it on our behalf. This is the language pulled throughout the Psalms, Isaiah, Jeremiah, right? This is why he came. Humanity had been weighed, it had been measured, and it had been found wanting. Sadly, each of us, all humanity passed to all humanity forward. You want to know how I know that God enacts judgment and, it, and pours out his wrath? The cross. The one person who didn't deserve to die, the one person who didn't deserve to drink that cup, did it willingly and experienced all the wrath of God poured out onto him. Jesus understood the assignment. God had a plan for Jesus, and Jesus understood it. Guys, for the sake of time, we're going to jump to verse 33, but I am going to do a quick summary of the verses in between, okay? If we were to unpack every single verse verbatim, we would uh, be here for a while. So jump with me to verse 33, okay? There's some, the, the story is still great. Please go back and study uh, verse, uh, verses kind of 12 through 32. But what happens in that flyover? Jesus is arrested, and he's brought first to, to Caiaphas. Caiaphas, the high priest, and some of the high priests there. And they have a little bit of a dialogue back and forth, basically, um, pinning on Jesus, uh, basically, hey, you've been teaching some really crazy stuff, basically. And so, um, but Jesus attests. He says, I've been preaching openly in the synagogues, um, out in public. I have thousands of witnesses. Ask any of them. They can attest to the things that we have been teaching. And here you are arresting me at night. Um, and at this time, we see Peter deny Jesus for the first time. Right? I, I get it. At first, I used to be really like, oh, Peter, come on, man, man up. You know, you just pulled a sword. You were ready to fight. It's like, oh, yeah, well, he kind of did just get off scot free and not get arrested, right? So he's trying to lay low a little bit. I get it. Denies Jesus once, and then the, 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 the Jews, the high priest, send Jesus over to Pontius Pilate. Now, the reason they're doing this is because the Jews could not kill their own, they did not enact capital punishment on anyone, typically. So what they did is they, they, they mustered this up. They took one phrase that Jesus said often and over, uh, over a couple different times in different verses, and where Jesus is claiming to be king, or a king, right? He was known as the king of the Jews. And they go to Pontius Pilate, and they say, hey, dude, can you kill this guy for us? He's claiming to be a king. He's going to want to rise up and muster up a crowd to overthrow Rome. The only reason Pilate is getting involved is because of this, is because there's a possibility that Jesus might be a king who wants to overthrow Rome. And in the midst of that, Peter denies Jesus two more times. And the rooster crows, and then we get to this dialogue. Everything about John chapter 18 is driving to this dialogue between Pontius Pilate and Jesus. Follow along with me in verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. 
what have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered to, over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from the world. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. And for this purpose, I was born. And for this purpose, I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, well, what is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Barabbas. I love this whole dialogue. This whole dialogue is fascinating to me because we've got the guy. So Pontius Pilate is basically the ruler over all the Judean area. Okay, he's he's uh, the, the Jews have their own like system of leadership and things like that, but they are subservient right now to Rome. Pontius Pilate is the most powerful person in the area. And we have Jesus, seemingly someone who has no power in a worldly sense, is arrested and brought to him. But look at the conversation. Who's really in control? Who's really leading the dialogue? Pilate may ask a few questions, um, but Jesus is the one really guiding that conversation, right? Let's be clear. Jesus is not on trial. In a worldly sense, yes, he's on a trial. There's a trial happening, but Jesus is willingly entering into this trial. And let's be clear. He could have gotten out of it multiple times, okay? We've already talked about how powerful he is, right? If this is not supposed to happen, Jesus, all right, God, bring the angels, send them down. All right, this little army, I'm going to wipe them out, right? He could have done something huge and miraculous like that. He could have simply let his disciples fight, right? He could have let Peter and Simon just have at it. Jump in, protect me. Guys, let's fight, let's go. Or as simple as this, right? Because we can get into the vernacular here of what is he being accused of, of being a king, he could have said no, right? Well, in the way you're asking me, Pilate, no, I'm not a king. Oh, okay, go, you're, you're, you're done, uh, leave. I don't, I'm not going to kill you. Jesus leads him in to allowing him to think and believing that he is a king, because we know he is, right? A different kind of king, though. Think about this. Is Jesus a king? Absolutely. But not one that Pilate should be afraid of, right? And not one that Pilate should be threatened by. He's not a king. He's not raising an army in Judea to overthrow Rome. Far from it. His kingdom is different. Think back to John chapter 3. If you've ever watched um, The Chosen, it is my favorite episode in The Chosen, okay? Um, Jesus is talking with Nicodemus, one of the Pharisees, okay? He's talking with them, and he describes his own kingdom in this way. Jesus describes his kingdom in this way. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. The kingdom Jesus mentions here is not an earthly kingdom. It's not measured out by boundaries and political uh, walls and uh, different things like that. It, it supersedes all worldly kingdoms. This is the truth that Jesus is bearing witness to before Pilate. It's the same truth that he witnessed to Nicodemus when he continued on, verse 13 to 14 in chapter 3, when he says, No one has ascended into heaven except he who has descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. We're not going to unpack the whole story of Moses uh, in, in the Old Testament there, where they raise up the bronze serpent, and the Israelites have to look upon it by faith, and then they are healed. Jesus is using this as a reference to him in the Old Testament. He is going to be lifted up on a cross just, days, just a day later, right? Um, a few moments later. Jesus is bearing witness to himself that he truly is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. Make no mistakes, friends. The, the Romans did not kill Jesus. They didn't manipulate. They didn't set up a botched trial here. And Jesus didn't get the short end of the stick. All of this was planned by God the Father. All of this was planned and, and allowed to happen by Jesus here in these moments. Jesus was willing to carry it all out. And that's our big point this morning. That's the driving whole point of John chapter 18. This is the, the whole driving point, in my opinion, of the gospel of John. The willingness of Jesus. 
this is such a, a, a revolutionizing uh, concept in my own head as I've been following Jesus for uh, some, some 18 years or so. And uh, Paul David Tripp has a really great Christmas devotional that I'm going to read a snippet from because I'm not going to do justice to his words. I'm just going to read his words. Um, but I've read this uh, each Advent season the last three years. And last year, it really stood out to me this day. And I have not gotten this out of my head uh, since the, the Christmas time this couple months ago. Um, and it's actually only the second day of, of reading. It's December 2nd, if you will. Ignore some of the Christmassy language. We all know I love Christmas, so forgive me for using a Christmas devotional. But it's all on the willingness of Jesus. Just listen to this. Close your eyes. It's not going to be on the screen. Close your eyes and just listen to Paul Tripp's language here as he unpacks the willingness of Jesus. One of the dark character qualities of sin is that we don't recognize as much as we should is unwillingness. We're often unwilling to do what God says if it doesn't make sense to us. We're often unwilling to inconvenience ourselves for the needs of someone else. We're regularly unwilling to wait. We're often unwilling to be open and honest. We're too often unwilling to consider the loving rebuke of another. We struggle to be willing to say no to our own wrong thoughts and desires. We often struggle to be willing to answer God's ministry call. Often we are unwilling to admit that we are wrong. We too often struggle to serve willingly and to give generously. Unwillingness is one of sin's powerful, damaging results. So here's what the Christmas story is all about. A willing Savior is born to rescue unwilling people from themselves because there is no other way. Jesus was willing to leave the splendor of eternity to come to this broken and groaning world. He was willing to take on human flesh with all of its frailty. He was willing to go through the dependency of childhood. He was willing to expose himself to all the hardships of life in this fallen world. He was willing to submit to his own law. He was willing to do his Father's will at every point. He was willing to serve, when he deserved to be served. He was willing to be misunderstood and mistreated. He was willing to endure rejection and gross injustice. He was willing to preach a message that would cause him personal harm. He was willing to suffer public mockery. He was willing to endure physical torture. He was willing to go through the pain of his father's rejection. He was willing to die. He was willing to rise and to ascend, to be our constant advocate. Jesus was willing. You see, it's not just the Christmas story. Rather, the entire redemptive story hinges on one thing, the eternal willingness of Jesus. The eternal willingness of Jesus. How often do you reflect on Jesus' willingness? Not downplaying his humanity, not downplaying the fact that he was weeping in the garden, not downplaying that he asked God to remove the cup. Nonetheless, he was willing to go do all of that for you and for me. Jesus was willing, friends. And perhaps I really only got two simple applications from this driving us home today. Jesus was willing, and Jesus is willing still. Jesus is willing. That's an everyday application to us as followers of Christ. He's willing to forgive you. He's willing to be patient with you. He's willing to walk with you. He's willing to be your shepherd today and tomorrow and the next day. He's willing to be your bread of life, your vine. He's willing to heal the brokenness that has been done to you and the brokenness that you have caused to others. He's willing to do all that because he was willing to die for you. He took on the judgment. He drank the cup of wrath. He took it on himself. I guess the real question that we all need to wrestle with, myself included, is are you willing to follow Jesus? Are you willing? Not begrudgingly, not bemoaningly, not complaining every two seconds. I, that's one of my biggest struggles. <laughs> I'm a great complainer. I'm, I'm a great, yeah, but, yeah, but, God. I'll do that, but can you clean up these things first so it make it a little easier for me for, to, to obey you in that way, in this way? Perhaps that better question is, where do I lack willingness to follow Jesus? And like I said, I'm asking myself that same question. And this past week alone, I think the thing that God keeps raising up in my own mind over and over again is my unwillingness 
unwillingness and in her interruptions, okay? So we all like to, to have our organization or things planned out. I'm doing this for God, I'm doing that for God. But interruptions happen every moment of every day, at least in our household. We've got three little kids, so interruptions is just gonna happen all the time. Whether it's an email, whether it's another red light, whether it's a wreck, whether it's um, someone coming up and talk, talking to me at Starbucks because um, I need to go work at Starbucks sometimes because I need like just to be around people sometimes. But uh, any of those interruptions, what's my reaction? Ugh, frustration, anger. I don't know what areas you lack willingness to follow Jesus. It might be a personal issue. It might be a personal concept uh, that you're wrestling with about the Bible. Maybe you don't trust something about God or trust God himself. What if you ask God, God, make me willing. Help me to be willing. Show me areas in my life where I need to be more willing. And one of the best responses we can have today is we get to go to the table of the Lord and participate in communion. And in just a little bit, I'm going to pray, and we're going to prepare our hearts for communion as a response. But as we look at the cup, as we look at the bread, we get to see what Jesus meant when he talked about the cup of wrath. Because on the night before uh, all this happened, he got to be with the disciples and he got to lift up a cup and talk about the new covenant in his blood. But today, let's not forget that in spite of all that happens and what's about to happen in the rest of the gospel narrative, Jesus was God, is God, had power, and it was all his plan. But most importantly, he was willing to submit himself to all that the Father had laid out for him. Let's you and I be willing to follow him. Let's you and I be willing to respond. Bow your heads with me in prayer. King Jesus, I'm blown away by your willingness. Your willingness to do anything and everything for us. No, you're not like a genie who we ask things and you just make things happen, Father, but your willingness to show your love towards me, I'm blown away. Father, forgive me when I lack willingness to follow you in the mundane daily things, to follow you in obedience, to trust you that the way you say life should be is the best way possible. Father, give me a more willing heart to follow. Give us as a church, Crossbridge, a heart that is willing and eager to follow you. Father, I, so many applications come. I, I think, am I willing to lay my life down for my wife and kids? Am I willing to put your kingdom, Father God, over my kingdom? Whether that's my house, my home, my 401k, my car. Is your kingdom more important to me? Father, allow us to be willing. Help us to respond with willing and open hearts because we have a Savior who was willing and still is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and grab your communion elements. Um, now we get to take the Lord's Supper using these elements to proclaim the gospel to ourselves. Okay, This is a reminder. We come to this table to remind ourselves of this. Why? Because we need it. I need it. But let's remember here Jesus' willing heart. His willingness to go to the cross. His willingness, willingness to put his body on the line and to pour out his blood for us. The bread and the juice are symbols that we worship him with today. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23 and 24. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. Go ahead and flip, flip the cup over. Peel off the top of the grape juice. In the same way, 
He also took the cup after supper and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And we proclaim together that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. Would you stand and worship with us?